We're joined today by Vic Cooley, who is the lead uh, increment scientist for this expedition, Expedition 42, as well as uh, the previous expedition, Expedition 41. And he's going to specifically talk to us a little bit today about one of the experiments that Samantha Cristoforetti has been working on this morning, the Fruit, fruit Fly Lab experiment. Thanks so much for joining us, Vic. Thank you, Brandy. I'm glad to be here. All right. Well, why don't we just start uh, by telling, give us a little background on, on what this experiment is. Well, uh, let me back up a little bit and tie it to what you were talking about, the, uh, the two plant experiments, the uh, right. advanced plant experiment and the anisotubule. They both use the model organism, the plant organism called Thalecress, as you pointed out. So that's a model organism in the plant domain. And of course, we have uh, a number of model organisms in the animal uh, kingdom. And you, a person could argue that fruit flies are the most important or oldest model uh, among all the model organisms in the animal kingdom. And this is because when the biologists were first trying to understand how chromosomes passed along inherited characteristics, the fruit fly was a very attractive model organism. And this was because it was easy to grow. Uh, it had a short generation of about 10 days. And you could, you could see visible characteristics without you know, dissecting and using a microscope. You could see inherited characteristics like eye color and uh, wing length and wing color and things like that. Okay. So all these characteristics made it very attractive. And so about 100 years ago, at the turn of the century, scientists uh, started doing this research on fruit flies and their chromosomes. Um, uh, it, it turns out that they have in their salivary glands some huge chromosomes relative to other chromosomes. They're actually about one fiftieth of the thickness of a dime. So it takes a just a very low powered uh, microscope to, to actually find these chromosomes. So for about two decades at Columbia University, there was a lab, and on the top floor of that lab, it became known as the fly room. Because that doesn't sound pleasant. All of these researchers had jars of flies, fruit flies, all over their desks doing various kinds of experiments. And then in 1933, the professor of those experiments, Thomas Hunt Morgan, went on to win the Nobel in, in medicine or physiology for elucidating the role that chromosomes play in, in passing along inherited characteristics. So that just kind of gives you an idea why you might regard the fruit fly among fish and mice and and roundworms, C. elegans, as as the most important model organisms among uh, the animals that we have as model organisms. We have all those others in different experiments on the space station, but this uh, this particular experiment uses those fruit flies because of all those characteristics I mentioned and because we have this long heritage of we know the, the complete genome of the fruit fly since the year 2000. I actually remember doing fruit fly experiments in seventh grade biology, I think. So I guess uh, anybody can do them, huh? Yeah. Well, <laughs> so what specifically are they looking for in this particular experiment? So uh, the, the main focus is immunity. And uh, it turns out that 77% of known human disease genes have a recognizable uh, counterpart among the genetic code of fruit flies. And 50% of protein sequences in the fruit fly have a um, mammalian analog. So there's a huge, you know, despite the disparate um, difference in the evolutionary tree you might think of between fruit flies and humans, there's a significant overlap of the genetic material and basic biological processes are similar. So for example, immunity. So it does help to, if we can understand how immune processes are affected by microgravity and we, we might be able to extend that to humans. And even more deeper than that, you know, microgravity acts as such a change in environment that it can, it has the potential to change basic information transfer processes that, that which is what chromosomes do. Sure. They tell the new organisms how to create proteins that are fundamental for all aspects of life. So there might be some basic discoveries yet to be made, and, and fruit fly would be an easy model organism for those to be made in. Okay. Well, what do the um, do the astronauts actually have to do with the fruit flies on orbit? Well, in fact, one of the things that uh, Samantha is doing today is feeding the fruit flies. We have to change out the, f the food trays every five days, and it turns out this is pretty important. We have to keep it on schedule for roughly a 20-day growing cycle. 
Uh, so every five days, we have to change out these food trays and give them fresh food. Okay. That doesn't sound too uh, labor-intensive. Uh, well, it's uh, it, it actually takes longer than you might think. It's about a four-hour activity. Got there. some video of her, I think, doing that actually here. Okay. So... Uh, there are several, uh, there are two main habitats. One is um, just a micro G habitat for the fruit flies, and another is a centrifuge, which is simulating 1G. So this acts as a control. Half of the fruit flies are in the centrifuge experiencing the gravity that we experience on Earth, and the other half are not in the centrifuge, so they're experiencing microgravity and the radiation environment. So the purpose of this control is to make sure that we're not confusing microgravity effects with perhaps radiation effects or other environmental effects on the space station.